In early 1942, with the Japanese in control of all the Philippines, the U.S. position in the Pacific was bleak indeed. With the fall of Corregidor in May, the Japanese greatly increased the area of their domination. Below the equator, the enemy began making landings on the northern coast of strategic New Guinea as early as March 1942. For the U.S., the job ahead was an enormous one. In Australia, American troops arrived in larger numbers as mid-1942 drew near to prepare for the moment when the offensive against the enemy could be seized. In the southwest Pacific, New Guinea was the major battlefield, where the Japanese and the Allies were finally to come to grips. Its spine was a rugged mountain range, tapering off into thick jungle. The Japanese were intent on pushing their advance even farther south. From nearby island bases, Japanese planes moved out in the first of a series of raids on the island continent. Control of the air in the equatorial zone off the mainland of Asia had been seized by the Japanese, who were able to fly over most of that territory with little fear of opposition. Japanese pilots ventured with impunity to the shores of Australia itself. The Australian port city of Darwin came under attack by Japanese planes some 50 times during 1942. In those early raids, the enemy had a relatively easy time of it. In late August 1942, Milne Bay at the tip of New Guinea became the newest Japanese invasion target. Seizure of the Milne Bay area was an important step in Japanese plans to gain control of all of New Guinea. But the invasion was not unopposed. Allied planes went to work on the enemy amphibious force. The Milne Bay area was not to be the enemies for the taking. The Japanese invasion troops gained a slim foothold, but were hit hard by U.S. bombers. American planes concentrated on the enemy's supply centers and badly crippled the Japanese beachhead operation. For several days, the invaders fought for a firm foothold. Finally, the enemy invasion force gave up the battle. For the first time in World War II, a Japanese offensive had been beaten off. The enemy amphibious force returned to its base. Overland in New Guinea, Japanese and Allied troops were separated by the formidable Owen Stanley Mountains. But the Japanese were filtering across that row of jagged ridges. Australian troops, the principal Allied ground forces in New Guinea for some months, were all that stood between the enemy and the rich rubber plantation country surrounding Port Moresby. To the Aussies fell the job of driving the enemy back. The route lay from Port Moresby across the precipitous Owen Stanleys to Buna on the northeast coast. The men who were to fight their way through that hazardous country along the Kokoda Trail were the diggers, Aussie soldiers of the 7th Division. For eight grueling weeks, Beginning in late September 1942, the 7th Division Aussies drove doggedly across the mountains under conditions which would have stopped many a fighting force. But the Aussies never let down. In spite of the trying conditions, the morale of the fighting men was good, right down to the privates and Lance Corporal. Pushing along the Kokoda Trail took some doing. The country was tough, and we even got used to crossing swamps. If we had had the ruddy Japs in the open, we could have mopped them up quicker than you could have said Jack Robinson. But it wasn't that easy in New Guinea. Most of our blokes were in good condition, but fair dinkum the jungle took it out of a man. There was always something needed doing, even when the Jap wasn't about. Now and then we stopped for a bit of tucker and a quick look at a snapshot of that sheila in Sydney. And we couldn't let ourselves go to the pack, even though we weren't in very civilized country. But the stops were short. There was always time to push on again, through the jungle and on up the trail. 
Every time a twig snapped in front of us or behind us, chances were it'd be a jap. And most of the time, the twigs didn't snap. The japs knew this kind of country like a book. When we did find them, we'd give them a good doing over. We knew dead to right some Japs wouldn't be bothering us again. Day and night we had to be on the watch. Often New Guinea seemed to be covered with nothing but kunai grass. But sometimes we'd feel we were getting somewhere. We knew there were Japs ahead and we had an idea there might be some back of us. There was no way of knowing. It was up and up till it seemed we'd soon be in the clouds. If there were any mountains higher than the Owen Stanleys, we didn't want to hear about them. Just when we felt all in, something would happen to buck us up. If that was a supply train, we couldn't take a ruddy chance on him missing us. But a thin smoke signal in the Owen Stanleys wasn't always easy to spot. In the air, Yank pilots were looking for signals just like ours. We must have been in a good position, and we were pretty lucky, too. At any rate, our signal was spotted by the sharp-eyed Yanks. We didn't know it at the time, but there were Aussies in that plane, too. And at the right time, they did an A-1 job. The rations usually got to us just when we were running a bit short. Thanks to the Yanks and some of our own blokes too, we wouldn't have to be living off the jungle. There's nothing like running out of grub to set a man to thinking about food. Before those packets hit the ground, we were after them. Talk about manna from heaven. Sometimes when the Yank pilots couldn't spot any diggers, they'd drop their load into native villages along the trail. The booms, that's what we called them, were a little scared at first. When our boys got hit, they were in good hands in a native village. We were well taken care of by the fuzzy wuzzy. Most of them never let us down. Nothing like a fancy dinner in Melbourne, perhaps, but a feast, believe me. After climbing the blasted trail, it was heaven to pitch into some bully beef and biscuits. News from home was just what the doctor ordered. Our gear got a bit of trimming up every now and again. Then we'd shove off again, up the sides of the Razorbacks. The top seemed thousands of miles away. Our cobbers, the Boongs, gave us a hand as we got near the ridge. They were as sure-footed as mountain goats and much handier to have around. Up near the top, we had to be especially lively about keeping an eye open for the enemy. We were about due for another scrap. We smelled trouble, so we thought it might be a good plan to have a look-see. And it turned out to be a good idea. Some Jap's numbers were coming up. Our attack on the enemy positions was sometimes an Allied show. Yank planes would give us air support when we needed it to help knock out a strong point. The Yanks poured it on. On the ground, we tackled the job from a different angle. 
The job was done, but we didn't come through unhurt. Moving our wounded back in that going wasn't easy. We were doubly glad to have the booms with us when any of our boys had to be taken out. The men got the most careful handling possible in that country. These wild New Guinea natives were about as gentle when they were carrying our boys as any one I'd ever seen. Somehow, our New Guinea helpers always managed to get the wounded men back to safety, no matter how tough that job was. At the nearest native village, our casualties would be taken care of to sweet. Everybody in the village turned out to do what they could, including all the Aussies who happened to be hanging around. From then on, the wounded were in the hands of the dock, who pulled the boys through most times. In October 1942, U.S. forces pushed along the coast to a point just below Buna. A Lilliput Navy, made up of pre-war island coastal ships, snaked through the treacherous reefs. The G.I.s made the rest of the trip in outriggers. The New Guinea natives were most cooperative. The G.I.s of the 32nd Division made a novel kind of landing and prepared to drive overland to link up with the Aussies and lay siege to Buna. The necessary supplies which would be needed on that drive were expertly unloaded. The campaign to take Buna was an expensive one for the Allies. Unfortunately, the necessary U.S. strength and ground forces was lacking in northeastern New Guinea during November 1942. The U.S. command, encouraged by the Japanese withdrawal at Milne Bay, expected to take Buna almost without opposition. But the G.I.s who were assigned the task of achieving that seizure were to find the situation quite the opposite. From Port Moresby, the U.S. Air Force reinforced the Allied troops in the Buna area by ferrying soldiers in considerable numbers across the mountains. Plus an occasional stowaway. This was the way to cross the Owen Stanley Peak. In less than an hour, the troops were making a trip which had taken the 7th Division Aussies almost eight weeks to do on foot. Some 15,000 troops were transported from Port Moresby over the Owen Stanleys to the battle area behind Buna. Thanks to the ferry service provided by the U.S. 5th Air Force, the battle for Buna was soon to change complexion. The jungle didn't slow down these fighting men. At the strips behind Buna, the men and material so vital to the Allied effort were unloaded without delay. Some 20,000 troops and great quantities of equipment were moved north by air during 13 weeks. Again, the New Guinea natives were on hand to assist. The Buna campaign was now progressing into a larger scale Allied offensive. On November 20th, Aussies and GIs joined forces and pressed the attack with renewed spirit. For six weeks, Allied troops invested Buna. The enemy resisted stubbornly, but finally the Japanese defense of the area surrounding that coastal town collapsed. Allied forces took the Japanese who were still alive prisoner and assumed control of Buna on January 2nd, 1943. The enemy hold on the northeastern coast of New Guinea was loosened. In early 1943, the situation in New Guinea began to get brighter with the eastern section now in Allied hands. After Buna fell, enemy convoys from Rabaul moved westward, bearing reinforcements for their troops at Lai. Allied planes took the offensive. In early March 1943, Allied pilots took off in quest of a Japanese convoy of some 16 ships. 
north of Cape Gloucester, New Britain, the pilots spotted their prey. This was the occasion all the Aussie and American pilots in the air over the Bismarck Sea had been praying for. pilots didn't have the air all for themselves. For three days, Allied planes attacked their target. Not a single Japanese ship escaped undamaged. Allied pilots had a picnic. U.S. and Australian planes sank 12 enemy ships and effectively put an end to this determined Japanese attempt to strengthen their New Guinea ground forces. In September, Allied amphibious forces moved up the back of New Guinea in an assault on the area surrounding Lai. In another leapfrog operation, typical of the Allied campaign on New Guinea, Aussies of the 9th Division invaded Lai to implement the drive overland of U.S. and Australian troops moving west from Puna. The value of fresh amphibious assaults in an extended campaign on a large island was readily apparent by the time Lai was invaded. Progress was far greater than it would have been if the ground forces had pushed overland through thick jungle against heavy troop concentrations. On the lengthy New Guinea coastline, landings could often be made at points where the enemy was not prepared to resist. Near Lai, the 9th Division Aussies encountered no opposition on the original landing. Once ashore, they drove inland against scattered resistance. The Aussies caught the defenders of Lai off balance. On September 5th, the eastern claw of the Australian pincer thrust at Lai moved quickly forward. The Australian attack group coordinated its drive with a force of American GIs who were fighting a diversionary action to the south. The fight for the Huan Gulf area was no easy operation. From Port Moresby, American paratroops prepared to fly north to reinforce their brothers in arms fighting in that sector. This airborne assault was personally supervised by the Southwest Pacific Theater commander himself. The paratroopers were to help break the back of enemy resistance at Lai. General MacArthur demanded that the objective be seized at once. 1,700 men of the 503rd U.S. Paratroop Infantry Regiment were to make the jump. Parachute landings in combat were comparatively rare in the Pacific, since the terrain was not often conducive to successful jumps. But on September 5, 1943, the U.S. troopers took off on a large-scale combat operation. On the success of this jump depended in large measure the effective wrapping up of the Lai operation. The men were intent on the job ahead. Scores of C-47s transported the paratroops across the Owen Stanley, supported by bombers and fighters. In a B-17, General MacArthur had a ringside seat from which to supervise the entire operation. The general grew especially interested as the planes drew near the jump point. As the vital area was reached, the A-20s laid down a smoke screen, which effectively shut off the planes and the paratroopers in the air from the sight of the enemy below. and prepared for their first combat jump. At 10.22 a.m., the paratroopers went into action. 
The jump that nods out went off as smoothly as it had been planned. The men of the 503rd performed like real veterans. In all, several hundred planes participated in the operation so vital to the success of the Lai campaign. The trip to Earth at precisely the spot planned took the paratroopers exactly one minute and ten seconds. The conversion to infantrymen was a matter of very few minutes. A few of the men took a little longer. The Natsab jump greatly improved the Allied position. Salamao fell to the Allies six days later. And a few days after that, Lai itself was in Allied possession. The enemy had been pretty well cleaned out of the entire area. The Allies had another secure position in their westward course along the northern coast of New Guinea. In the fruitless struggle, the Japanese had fought a desperate delaying action. The Aussies entered Lai itself on September 16th. The enemy had completely evacuated the battered coastal town. In the 12-day engagement, the enemy had lost men and equipment in vain. Allied air power had provided the necessary added punch which helped to hasten the Japanese defeat at Lai. The ground gained on New Guinea by virtue of the victory at Lai was considerable. The Japanese-controlled part of New Guinea was still the larger, but it was shrinking fast. With the Lai Salamawa area won, the Allied troops consolidated their position and prepared for future assaults against other enemy concentrations in New Guinea. The GIs and Aussies who had taken the Lai area in a truly joint operation moved on to extend Allied control on the Huan Peninsula. But for many, there were a few days in which to relax before going back into action. New Guinea wasn't quite up to the standards of real rest areas, but at least the men could take a short breather. From the airstrips near Lai, now in Allied hands, American and Australian planes continued the attack against the enemy without pause. From the new advanced bases, Allied pilots could pound enemy positions in western New Guinea without let-up. The missions against Japanese army units, supply dumps, and shipping were stepped up during November and December. By the end of 1943, the enemy in New Guinea was finally completely on the defensive. U.S. 5th Air Force bombers carried the fight to the enemy, softening up the areas where new leapfrogging invasions were already planned. Eastward, the Japanese-held island of Bougainville was about to occupy the attention of American Marines. On November 1st, 1943, they invaded that island in force. 